Okay, let's let's get going. Uh, we've got some of the uh, a few more people joining us, but uh, uh, we can uh, get going. Um, we're at that limit of what's possible, what's sensible with introductions. So, um, but if you can introduce yourselves really quickly, just who you are and where you're from, for um, purposes of the um, minutes. Um, and I'm going to break tradition and start at the bottom of my list. Uh, so just to confuse everybody and make sure you're all awake after lunch. Um, so Victor. Hi there, uh, my name is Victor. Uh, I'm with Eat All Well as uh, one of the uh, CC Data Analysts. Excellent, thank you. Um, Triumph, oh no, uh, yes, Triumph. Hi all, um, uh, my name is Triumph Okoje, um, Project Manager at uh, the DFT are uh, responsible for uh, the Open Buses program, which includes BODs um, and the other ancillary services that are related to BODs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tony Davis? Davies, sorry. Uh, right, I've known it's Tony Davis, uh, data analyst at Trump Barton. Hi, uh, Teresa? Oh, yeah, Teresa Jolly, um, note taker, secretary. Secretary, I was trying to be clever there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rob. Hi there, Rob West, um, founder of Illidium. Uh, Richard. Uh, <clears throat> uh, hello. Uh, yeah, Richard Hall. I work with Peter and Victor at Ito World. Uh, dealing, among other things, with uh, NAPTANs and uh, associated records. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter? Peter Stoner, Ito World. Uh, Patrick? Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, Patrick Smallman, Application Support Engineer at Ito World for Analyze Bus Open Data and the Ito Transit Hub offering. Uh, uh, Nick? Uh, Nick Carey, <coughs> data technologist, um, actually joining Teresa's company uh, as assistant secretary. <laughs> uh, Nick. Not just that, Nick, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Druscott. Yeah, so a network planning lead within Cornwall Council, but with a particular focus on how our operators are dealing with BODs and information generally. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, Morgan. Good afternoon, I'm um, Morgan Evans, I work for Eto World and I'm a data analyst. Okay, uh, Mike Nolan. Hi everyone, Mike Nolan, uh, Customer Experience Manager at Travelline. Thank you, uh, Mike Baxter. Afternoon everyone, uh, uh, Transport Development Officer at Leicester City Council with uh, focus on real-time information system management and improvement yeah uh josh i uh, josh goodwin from bustimes.org thank you uh haraj yep afternoon all uh new product owner for naptan taking over from sarah welcome uh hannah Hi everyone, um, I'm Hannah, also a product owner um, working on Naptan alongside Haraj. Uh, David? David Baxter from Ticketar, helping operators with data and particularly BODs at the moment. Uh, uh, Dan? Uh, hi, yeah. Dan Saunders from Basemap. Uh, yeah, we uh, do lots of stuff with product transport, NCSD, travel line, TNDS, all that kind of stuff. Excellent. Uh, David Booth. The one who nearly said for David Bachelor. I have David Booth that uh, worked for Mersey Travel, um, which is now the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority uh, in the IT department, uh, dealing with the timetables and stuff. Excellent. And Andy. 
Oh, hi, uh, Andy from uh, Passenger. Um, I'm filling in for uh, colleagues that you might be more familiar with, uh, Chris Sherry and Greg Davies, uh, who uh, um, are not here today. OK, excellent. Uh, and I am Tim Rivett. Uh, I run Artig and I'm your chair this afternoon. Um, so um, I'm aware that um, Oh, we've got apologies from Keith Sabin. I better not forget that. Um, so I'm aware that Triumph needs to get off uh, as quickly as possible. Um, so um, I suggest that we um, deal with minutes um, and actions from the last meeting uh, at the end because I suspect most of them will be picked up anyway um, as we go through. Sorry just to confuse you there Teresa. No, no, no. But, uh, so Triumph uh, bus open data program. Hi all. Um, it's good to be with um, all of you again today. Just give me a minute while I share my screen. Oh, OK, let me know when you can see my screen. Yeah, we can see yeah. your screen. Unfortunately, I cannot slide show. Um, so I'll put that there. So I thought, you know, as part of the update um, that I gave uh, this, um, I give on this meeting today was around, you know, some of the the the, the, the updates on, on publishing and compliance. Um, this is a very important topic at the moment. For a lot of stakeholders um, uh, within, you know, within the program. Um, so, <clears throat> in terms of, you know, registered operators and scope for boards, um, at the moment, um, as at the last um, sort of, you know, uh, big sort of monthly update that we had, um, there are about four hundred and thirty-seven uh, registered operators. Um, um, then of that, um, they are 9,464 um, OTC registered services, which 9,452 um, are in scope for bots or have been determined to be in scope for bots. Um, in terms of published data, um, we've got uh, 948 uh, timetable data sets, uh, a 3% impro uh, improvement from the last month. Uh, 355 EVL data sets, um, 1,153 um, fair data sets. Um, uh, uh, that constitutes um, over 95,000 fair products. Um, in terms of compliance uh, for registered services, so for timetables, uh, 6,000, 6, well, over 6,700 um, uh, published services. Of which uh, operators with at least one published data set form 315. Um, operators with at least one published ABL data set form 257, uh, whilst operators with at least one published first data set um, is 239. So for compliance, we are currently looking at 22% for timetables, 61% for um, ABL. Uh, in terms of on an operator level for AVL, 61% and 55% for fares. From a, a vehicle um, level, uh, we're looking at 25,199 um, um, you know, um, uh, vehicles that we receive AVL data for. And that, um, as per our estimation, um, it's about 81% um, uh, compliance. In terms of user base, uh, for board, we've got 714 publishers, um, uh, 283 um, agents, and we've got over uh, 2,153 uh, registered consumers uh, who are consuming board data um, on a monthly basis, uh, or who are consuming board data on a regular basis. Um, now, um, this um, we just 
you know, this essentially, you know, is the kid is it will touch upon what we did in January and what we we, we did in Feb. So um as by the last update we gave, you know, we're looking at doing so sort of, you know, the, the initial use of those wireframes and insight sessions in January for disruption. We did all of that. Um and there was um you know, um, uh, uh, data discoveries around a, a, a few things. Um, now we have uh, completed all of that, and in February we did a lot of the user testing um, and sort of data insight, uh, data research, uh, user research, and user insight sessions. We are currently finalizing design and we commence um, development uh, for for disruptions uh, in February. Um, working with um, the UX team, um, you know, and you know, and policy officials within DFT, um, we are also we've also pressed on with the work around you know flexible and um, service data sets, where we are looking at representing um, uh, flexible service or looking at how we represent uh, demand responsive and flexible services on to the bus open data system. Um, in Feb, we continue to work on compliance and monitoring. Um, you know, we also released uh, the simple first data validation to production. Um, and we also did some, you know, completed some work on, well, not completed, at least commenced and made considerable progress on some work around complex, uh, complex fares um, or complex discounted fares. Uh, and as I said before, you know, we commenced disruptions in, in, in February for, for, for the disruption uh, processing service. And we'll continue to, you know, develop that until, you know, that product is handed over, uh, which we anticipate would happen in around June, July this year. Um, then, um, you know, there is um, some work we're trying to do to to increase compliance. Um, you know, and you know, this is, uh, you know, we, we would manage this very delicately because, you know, we are increasingly becoming aware of um the you know the, the situation um that data publishers are and and what they have to, to 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 deal with in terms of making that uh data available to boards uh so for example um this week you know we've been on the road um you know speaking with you know boss operators so i spoke with first boss yesterday at your depot in Hunslet leads um and i was with stagecoach today before and all of this is just geared towards better understanding um, the data publishing journey uh, for bus operators. Um, uh, that being said, you know, I'm putting all that into consideration, you know, we would still like to ensure that there is greater parity between fares and timetables data. Um, um, but, you know, like I said, we would put all things into consideration in terms of pushing that, that piece of work. Um, then we also um, had a few training sessions to enable um, um sort of you know self-serving uh for various um um for various reasons of 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 the service um but we've also uh looked at you know doing some work in improving the comms um as was you know related to us uh in the last PTIC meeting but also you know through other channels so reformulating the comms to ensure that the comms make sense and it's not all technical speak um in terms of between now and may um, just, you know, um, or between Jan and May, just giving uh, a brief uh, insight as to what, you know, potentially um, the roadmap is going to look like um, for what people can expect. Um, obviously, we delivered sort of the, the OTC API um, compliance matching in, in Jan. Um, then uh, we did some work around sort of matching reports for CRVM and Trans Exchange to publishers. That I believe is the latest release, um, and you know we are we are sort of speaking with the industry around that piece of work, um, and getting feedback and insight and opportunities for improvement on that release. Um, then uh, starting in March, we will continue to work we're doing on compliance monitoring, um, and we will continue to work that we're doing around sort of simple first value data. Um, then we then intend to sort of do some work around matching reports for CRVM and trans exchange for consumers, so those who consume the data, um, to help us, you know, 
So whilst we're doing all the work we're doing around compliance and you know that matching report for publishers and you know um you know trying to 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 make uh, life as easy as we can for publishers and and using that to improve the data quality as we intend to uh, just to also derive the benefits that we want to derive from board. We're also doing um, a, a sort of a, a parallel piece of work with consumers uh, to able to enable them sort of match that data, consume that data. And go on to do the wonderful things that we anticipate they will do with uh, with board data. Um, we intend to um, you know continue um, you know doing the work we're doing around flexible services and PLA three is a <coughs> an important date as far as that's concerned. Um, and we intend to commence uh, around March April the work around sort of complex fair guidance. Uh, then in around sort of. April, we intend to have delivered all the deliverables we wanted to deliver uh, around the Create Fair Data Service. Um, so that's, you know, um, a brief overview of the roadmap. Um, then we just want to touch a bit about sort of, you know, um, complex fairs. Um, so we we know that the complex fair statutory deadline was on the 7th of Jan this year. Um, due to a few complexities, um, you know, we have been unable to support that date. So it's just, you know, um, you know, communicating with, you know, everybody who is, um, who might have any worry or issue about that that date to say we understand that we are not where we are at the moment to uh, to enforce that date. We would continue working with operators around complex fairs to ensure that. You know, we provide as much support and as much resource as possible to support that. Um, we are not um, agreed on on the new date. When that happens, we would communicate that with the industry. But at every point of the of the way, um, we would you know we would communicate openly and provide as much support as we can to support the work that we're doing around complex fairs and the publication of complex fairs. Um, so that you know essentially is is, is what. We, we intend around sort of uh, complex fairs. Um, we we would like to have been able to update um, the deadline, but that's still work in progress. We will communicate through various channels once that is done, like I said. Um, but we would hope to provide between April and July some publishing guidance on complex fairs, um, working with um, sort of you know software suppliers uh, to you know in getting them involved in, in that process to ensure that, you know, we then ultimately downstream support um, publishers to, to publish uh, complex web data. Um, then around August, September, we, also, we, we, we anticipate that we, we would be in a position to, to release some, um, uh, well, well, to test some complex fair validation features. Uh, and once again, we would engage uh, suppliers and operators uh, 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 in that process. Um, that, in a nutshell, is, is the update from the board team. I'm happy to, to, to take any questions. Thank you very much. Does anybody got any questions for Triumph? Peter. Yes, Triumph, I'm just wondering, as you were speaking, whether whether we ought to consider reconsider the title Complex Fairs. I just don't think it conveys politically what we should be trying to convey to the public at the moment. If a fair is too complex, I think we shouldn't, the industry shouldn't be offering it. I, I, I'm sure we are meaning something other in a technical sense about what a complex fair is, but I just felt that possibly it gives all the wrong messages and um, implies it might be too difficult for us to embark on, which which isn't a isn't a good good word. I just See what you think. Um, suggestion. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so that that makes sense. Um, yeah, we. I'm, I'm I'm happy to 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 look into that and and suggest alternative appropriate phrasing um, for um, for 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 complex fairs. Um, yeah, uh, maybe that's one I'd I'd, I'd take away and. And, and discuss with stakeholders and and uh, and, and come back to, to this forum.
Or can you hear any, me? Yeah, we can okay. do. Yeah. Uh, any more from anybody before I talk about flexible services and things? No. Okay. Thank you, Triumph. Um, so, um, as you may know, at the moment, uh, BODs for planned information, timetables for want of a better word, um, only supports um, fixed route and fixed timetable services. Um, there are an increasing number of uh, services that don't have a fixed route and or a fixed timetable. Um, there's some legal definitions around uh, flexible services, um, but that doesn't cover the whole gamut of uh, operations that people might want to have in a journey planner if you're wanting to find out how to get from a to B uh, and needs to know whether there is any form of public transport. Um, generally, though, um, we're regarding those as flexible services, even if it's a bit wider than the legal definition of a flexible bus service. Um, so at the moment, BODS only handles fixed route and timetables. There's some work that I'm uh, doing, trying to look at what technically needs to happen in data standards and formats to enable flexible services to be supplied to BODs. Um, there was some work done back in 2021 uh, by KPMG. There was some a discovery project that some of you might have been involved in that identified some of the challenges and issues. I'm picking that up and trying to understand more of the technical things. Some of you have had some emails from myself asking for examples and um, uh, data if you've got any, um, but I know that uh, I haven't reached out to everybody. Um, so, um, it's going to take a few weeks to understand how to model as many types of flexible services possible. Um, so there is plenty of time to get involved if you think you have something to add on flexible services. Please do get in touch. Um, with me, um, ideally um, in with my um, consulting uh, address, which is in the uh, chat, um, and we can talk about how we can um, engage and work out whatever particular example you've got that you think is particularly interesting, um, particularly if you've got some edge cases, uh, you've got something uh, unusual or you think is unusual um, in your area, I'd be interested to find out about that to make sure that we can try and model as many different types as we can. I very much doubt that we can do every type that's out there, but uh, let's try and uh, in deal with as many as possible. Um, so uh, I don't know whether anybody's got any uh, questions and, and thoughts at this point. Um, I know David Batchelor's got some issues with sort of flexible service type um, things with uh, set down on request. Which is probably the next sort of thing to, to fluidly move on to. Yeah, so David, your set down on request challenge. Right, so we've got examples where services run 
to certain points or even a complete journey on request only. Um, and if we put it in as serving all the points and setting down, the compliance mechanisms then try and measure it at all those points. Um, if you don't put it in at all the points, you take away the chance of journey planning. And because BODS won't do the traditional look in the notes and it says set style on request only, we need a way of reconciling those before we get on to totally flexible services. Yeah, OK. Um, out of interest, any of the data consumers on the call, have, do, have you got ways of handling these type of stops and service at the moment? I don't know. There's, we're quite producer heavy at the moment uh, on the call. No. Oh, oh Mike. Oh, I'm just, I was just going to say, um, the 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 situation David's describing is is where a service will will be a longer route if someone wishes to go all the way, so to speak, rather than half the way. Is that is that is that the kind of thing rather than I can remember when I was a part time bus driver years ago that there was a service that would go to Dunton Bassett. Um, and the last service would go to Luttle if there's someone wanted to go there. Is that the kind of thing we're talking about? Uh, yeah, there's also diversions off more problematically, I think, is, is the right. ones where it diverts off into a village on request and it doesn't otherwise visit that village. Right. OK. But there's there's as many variants, I suspect, as there are things that you can think up. So it's it's coping with com a, a commented description for a route. Oh. Yeah, I think the thing, David, is that you want it to be able to be dealt with automatically, isn't it, rather than in comments? Well, yeah, because Bodge won't take comments, and it does then mean that we don't have to describe it to lots of different peoples in different ways. Um. Mm. And really, all we're saying is you can't use it for compliance. You can use it for journey planning because it's a possibility, but sometimes it's only a possibility if you're already on the bus. OK, yeah. Yeah. OK, um, Peter Stoner. Yes, I, I, I remember uh, uh, a PTEC meeting or, or its predecessors to uh, before an ACO conference in Sutton Coalfield. It, it might have been the 1990s, but I felt it was a bit of um, um, uh, Roger Slevin steered, I think, to a very useful categorization of, of the different options. And from from then on, uh, I've really held the, you know, the, the, the strategic hope that at some time that the booking systems will somehow uh, link with the real time systems. And uh, I, I mean, I did discuss it with, um, got quite a long way, I think, with it. Was it, Mo was it Mobisoft who were running the, uh, at some point, were, were doing, uh, um, running some of the DRT booking systems? And it, it did seem that there's a potential for, for getting this. I do feel that there's we're always between quick fixes to try to do something which was going to be very inadequate around flexible service and grappling uh, with the the real solution that's required that actually um, means that everybody has to come around to a, a really quite um, sophisticated uh, integration, um, which which may be a step too far, but um, it, 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 unless we grapple with that, I think we're we're going to be between something that's unsatisfactory and something which really tackles the problem. Because of course, with you know the, the services, whether it continues or or, or not, you 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 you've always got um, two 
possibilities of booking that somebody of course is off the bus and going through a booking system to tell the bus to divert or extend or whatever's required and somebody who's on the bus who's just telling the driver uh, but really even if they're on the bus telling the driver the driver ought to have a way uh, of being able to uh, take that as a booking and uh, get that in to the re to the um, real time system and the projections so that you know what is then happening on the on 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 the service on on that day it of course then can update all the downstream uh, systems and you you then categorize that diversion in two ways first of all you you um you the diversion becomes a fixed route. You can tell everybody on that diversion it's going, so you can you can effectively pick up additional um, bookings on that particular um, uh, diversion because it's you, you're committed to doing it. You know, I mean, this might be several days ahead that it's booked, of course, and that and at the same time you are also discounting all the other possibilities that now cannot be fulfilled because you have accepted that booking and committed the vehicle to what one or, or 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 variant of the options that are available and equally that is um a real time information as an adjustment to the schedule and um really i can see no other way that it needs to come through something siri like that uh, integrates with with the schedules mm. okay yeah some useful thoughts there thank you peter um nick You're on mute. Yeah, so I'm just looking at this issue on set down only on. So we've got a service which has got two journeys at the end of the day, set down only. If I look at that service in bus times, it's using BOD data. It's correctly appending the times against those set down only stops with a S mark, except the last stop, bizarrely. So I don't know if that comes back to the original data that's been created. So in this case, Travelize Southwest act as the agent for this particular operator, or whether that is in how the data is coming across in BOD's format that's causing the last stop to be fixed, even though it is a set down. Yeah, OK. So it seems it's sort of there in terms of displaying the data. There might just be a, a niggle around last stop. Yeah, and every last stop's going to be set down then, or should be set down only anyway. Otherwise, people are on a journey to nowhere. That's a good point. Yeah. So when, yeah, when you look in a trans exchange, the stop action is always set down, isn't it? If it's it coded correctly. Mm. Yeah. Well, jo Josh is on here somewhere, so perhaps he can tell us how he reads it. Uh, yeah, I, I think I just assumed that every st last stop is set down only. So I, even if it is coded as set down only, I don't show it on the last stop. But where are you getting the set down only for the other stops from? Are you getting that from the notes or are you getting it from the fact that they just say set down? Uh, I think if a, something in the trans exchange more formal than a note. Yeah, so so you're just getting set down, so you can do set down, but you wouldn't know it was set down on request, which is where we're trying to yeah. differentiate. Yeah, OK, thanks for that. So that proves that someone who's who's trying to do it right. Is is taking the data and still possibly not getting it right. Yeah, yeah. OK. Um, so in terms of taking that forward, if people want to be involved in some more discussions on that, um, then I guess get in touch with David or myself and we'll uh, we'll set up a call to uh, to work through the potential um, solutions. Rob. 
Yeah, just a quick thought on this. Um, it strikes me that all such set down only stops would be on request, wouldn't they? Is there a situation where you would flag in a trans exchange timetable that a stop is set down only, but that wouldn't be on request? Does that make sense? Or, yeah. or could we assume in the compliance side that if you've got a set down only flag on a stop, then you apply the rules for on request? That may be a clever solution. I mean, technically, every stops a set down or pick up on request, but that's a slightly facetious uh, view. Peter. Yeah, well, I think I think you'll find it's partly to do with whether, of course, the the vehicle is just passing the stop or is uh, diverting, and it in mm. bods terms uh, uh, and matching to the real time, it, it has to do with uh, how much uh, distance is being covered in the and in the intermediate time. So that um, I think we are trying to get uh, in the discussion. It needs to have something a little bit more than just uh, the set down. It is about the request and whether a diversion is uh, being uh, carried out at this point or not. Yeah, OK. Right, so as I say, if you want to get involved in this in more detail, then get in touch with me or uh, David and we'll put something together. Um, other changes and work going on linked to timetables in BODs. Um, we're having a look following on from the special um, session we had of PTIC in January, um, looking at um, bank holidays, um, having a think still about the feedback that we got from that session, which was very useful as to how to make bank holidays easier for people to manage uh, in BODs because it's one of the sticking points um, that we've got. Um, the Welsh uh, Assembly are uh, working on uh, their version of BODs um, and thinking about similar things. And so um, there's some cross conversations going on about handling cross border um, services and things like that. Um, and Scotland needs to get involved as well in that, because one of the real challenges that we've got is the Scottish bank holidays. Um, so that work um, carries on. Um, I don't think there's a particular update on location data. Um, and um, I think probably I don't can't see Stephen from KPMG, Stephen Penn on the call about fares, but Triumph's given us an update on the plans for fares anyway. So that then brings us on to um, NAPTAN, which isn't on the agenda because I didn't know um, whether anybody from the team was going to be able to join us. But we've got uh, two. We've got Haraj and Hannah. I don't know which of you is going to update us on what's happening in the world of NAPTAN. Yeah, hi guys. Um, yeah, so last minute. Um, so we haven't got uh, uh, you know a lot to talk about in this meeting. So we'll have more to talk about in the next meeting. So this is more just for us to introduce ourselves, um, sort of as a product owners. So in the uh, NAPTAN space, sort of we're currently working on. We've been working on a lot of sort of back end uh, improvements to the system. Um, we're also working currently on the front end space, implementing like the multi upload, so you can upload more than one file. Uh, and we're also in wider talks. So Tim, we've already had chats. I think we just spoke with Ben uh, last week around sort of the other pressing policy issues that are kind of around at the moment, involving closed bus stops and all all that lovely world of stuff. Um, so yeah, I guess a quick kind of plug is we want to you know engage with with yourselves and others um in the ecosystem so i'll put mine and hannah's email in the chat and we can look to sort of start getting some focus groups up and running and some sort of one-to-ones just so we can learn and uh, understand you know how 
we can shape Naptan going forward. So yeah, I guess that's the kind of a really quick update from myself. So we'll just be listening and absorbing information. And Hannah, do you want to add anything else? No, I echo that. Okay. Um, anybody got any questions about Naptan? Dan. Hi, yeah. Um, was there, I can't remember, there's been so many Naptan meetings in the last couple of years. Was there a report being done by someone about the future of Naptan? Was that ever published at all? As one of those that was KPMG or Deloitte or someone was doing a thing report, was that ever published? Yeah, so it, it's ready to be published. I believe it might be, I need to double check, so don't hold me to this, but uh, end of March is when it's expected to be uh, released kind of publicly. Um, but again, I will. I can get double confirmation. I can let Tim know, and he can communicate out. But yeah, um, I've. It's yeah. It's it's shortly coming. Okay. I just feel like with nap time, we're kind of going around in circles a bit. I think in the last couple of years, we keep going about the future of nap time. We spoke about it two years ago. We seem to be speaking about it again now. I just kind of feel as a kind of consumer that uses nap time every day. Um, we're just going round and round in circles, though. So I'm just quite keen to find out actually, you know, what is the roadmap? What's actually going to happen with it? And kind of a bit more action and maybe a bit less, a bit less talk, maybe. I don't know. That's my kind of view. Yeah, and uh, I mean, hopefully, me and Hannah will be able to provide that um, and you know give a bit more of a strategic view and actually, yeah, put action to place and sort of into place um, versus you know talking. But it'd be, I guess, the main thing is for us is first of all to just understand, you know, yourselves, the kind of ecosystem. And that will allow us to focus on what really needs to be improved on the service um, and absorb, I guess, what has also been discussed in the previous public meeting. So I know we're looking to have a, a public meeting in the near future. So sort of also keep your eye out for that one as well. OK, we'll do. OK, Keith. I wasn't going to ask, but Dan asked. At the last meeting when Sarah uh, was um, present, mm -hmm. she mentioned that she was looking to upload the previously done public webinar about the future of Naptan. Um, it doesn't appear that she's been able to upload it, but also that the actual DFT YouTube chain, chain, uh, channel. Uh, uh, whatever it's called, channel. Mm -hmm. YouTube uh, account, yeah. Finished, uh, vanished, basically. So I didn't know whether you were up to speed on what was happening with that. Yeah, so um, effectively we're in touch with YouTube because I believe something's happened on their end where the channel was literally disappeared from the face of the earth so we we've escalated with them and they're, they're working closely with us to get that restored and then we should get that uh, public meeting that was uh, meant to be uploaded by Sarah up as soon as possible once we have um, the account restored so yeah I'm aware um, but yeah we're, we're in talks with YouTube but thanks for mentioning that Keith yeah Mike so I've been out of the loop for a while and can I just ask what has there been a, a change of, of organisational structure in Naptan then? Is Sarah moved on to other things or is, is that not public knowledge? Yeah, so Sarah's moved on to another project. Um, so obviously it was previously Adrian, uh, then Sarah, then now myself and Hannah for the time being. Right, OK, OK. So there's just, it, it's, it, it, these these things like the YouTube channel, they, they just happen to have fallen by the wayside because something that YouTube have done or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's precisely that. Yeah. And that's what we're, we're um, chasing up and, you know, fingers crossed they've come back and we're sort of in conversation. So hopefully um, we can get a resolution for that quite quickly. OK, that sounds good. Thank so you. just one more question. Were you two with the DFT or are you contractors working for the DFT, just for my reference? So I'm with DFT, but I'm employed by the Cabinet Office. I'm not necessarily a contractor. Yeah. Um. Uh, and Hannah, I guess she's a contractor. I'm a contractor from ThoughtWorks. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, just one more, one more question. So, uh, on, on the last meetings, I've not really got interested, but I thought it was worth asking for the minutes anyway. Uh, so, one of the previous kind of, uh, we had a demo of the new Naptan viewer tool, uh, and there was a way of effectively 
people having to download a GitHub thing and then run something to view the NAPTAN stop details to replace the old ITO well tool. Uh, have you got any updates or know anything about that tool? And because I think there was talk about actually the DFT hosting it or something like that. So uh, I think local authorities had were struggling to download GitHub and host things and do things. Have you got any more update on that tool? And that's always a hot topic. Yeah, yeah I, so I, I, I second that as well. Sorry to butt in, but yeah, I, I would agree that we, we do need that view at all. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So you're referring to the uh, NAT10 mapper. And um, if I remember correctly, yeah, you had to download it onto your machine and so forth. So um, that was with, uh, obviously, was previously with Sarah and Tom. So what I will do is I can get an update for that. I don't have an update as of yet, but for um, sort of the subsequent meeting, I can get information as to what the you know what the update is on that if we're going to look to locally host it to make it easier and so forth um but i'll i'll, I'll kind of voice the concerns as well that's all okay. i can offer on that yeah yes yeah. i mean it works when you download it and you have the permissions but pretty much every organization that's got any form of it policy controls does not like end users downloading um stuff from github and having yeah. to have you know in development environments in place and things like that so uh it's uh it's a it works but it's a challenge for most users to access it so, yeah yeah well, yeah are, are the instructions for doing that still still in existence yes Just they're on the github site yes yeah, they should be. Yeah, they're on the GitHub site. So yeah. I don't believe that's been changed. No, I mean yet. the the pointer to the GitHub GitHub site is that um, somewhere listed. Uh, I can I can find out after we you. finish this. Yeah, I can find out and I can see yeah. if I can plug it in the chat before the end of the okay. meeting. All right, yeah. thank you. Cheers, thank you. Sorry. So I I did have one more question. Was when when obviously the Naptan project was being redone and you've looked at and you're doing the mapper thing there was lots of talk about what the actual rules were um, and there was a massive spreadsheet and people had interpretations and at, at some point it was said that the DFT were going to release what these actual business rules and rules were in, in an English format but that never came to fruition from my understanding either so whether that's something that's going to be picked up and shared something we can go yeah something we can go find out um, and can let you know but yeah as of from my knowledge, I'm not. I, I can't give you an answer as of now. Oh, yes. thanks, thanks, Tim. Yeah, cheers for that, Tim. We'll I have a shortcut. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll find out for you, Keith, and, uh, and we'll be in touch. I've taken a note down. Um, Peter, can I just ask about uh, th 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 this meeting has in the in the past um, steered through the, the codes for Isle of Man and Channel Islands and getting them um, in place and in the standards. Um, and I think that the data has uh, certainly for Isle of Man has been available for some time, but it never appears in the NAPTAN um, portal. Yeah, um, very keen that it, it would and Channel Islands as well uh, as that might be available soon. I did write to Sarah about it, but I can pass on, send the email to you as well uh, with the details. But it'd be great if this if this meeting could see the results of its work um, of what might be have been several years ago um, to to get this uh, uh, this trying to get this progressed. Likewise, uh, Jersey and so forth, uh, Peter, that obviously have yeah. got stuff them but not access or admin rights yeah their, their data i think is available channel islands the data is coming yeah oh, was, i was i i don't know where the channel islands are I've referenced ah, <laughs> jersey and guernsey <laughs> yes, that's right. yeah keith if you could uh, forward the emails or any you know any re relevant emails and that'd be great and uh yeah so at least we have visibility on that as well okay uh keith do you have your hand up again no, I think that's no. legacy. Legacy, yeah. No worries. Yeah. Okay. Um, if there's nothing more on Naptan, then thank you. That was a very useful. Um, sorry if you felt like you were being grilled at your first showing. It's okay. <laughs> no, we, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Thicker skin than that. Good, good. Um, right. Okay. Um, journey plan of performance. So, um, if you remember. Um, for those of you that have been involved in these for a while, um, about 12 months or so ago, 
we had um, various conversations about journey planner quality of um, results and things like that um, and um, that sort of um, went into a bit of abeyance whilst um, there were various conversations going on. Um, John Carr was the um, lead for that. Um, he is on a train um, at the moment. Unfortunately, he is with us, but I don't know whether he can um, join in or not or whether he's in listen only mode. Um, are you there, John? No, I suspect he's in uh, he's he's in uh, listen only mode, but he has sent me some um, notes and thoughts. Um, so the um, John tried to make a journey to a football match, um, being a bit of a football fan that he is, um, and struggled to plan uh, a journey across London originally um, and out into Hertfordshire um, and identified various uh, challenges with with that and ways that they could be solved. Um, we've had various conversations with John with his ATCO um, hat on. So ATCO is the Association of Transport Coordinating Officers, um, who are uh, the responsible transport people in authorities. Um, and um, there's been a number of things identified and issues that people are experiencing with journey planners um, from things like strikes and unforeseen disruptions with altered timetables not being reflected, um, cancellations, something that uh, has been a, you know, a bit of an industry-wide problem over the last um, year or so with driver shortages and things like that. Um, and that goes not just for uh, journey planners, but also uh, real-time systems and things like that. Um, and there's been quite a lot said and work done on that one but it's a particular problem for journey planners where you know, they don't tend to be updated in real time or semi real time um consistency of responses from different journey planners giving quite widely different um routes and journeys which is confusing um some journey planners um miss Miss services um, that should be there, um, which causes lots of confusion. Um, and um, generally, if you go back to the turn of the century, there was some work done um, just as tra National Travel Line was being set up to look at uh, what a good journey planner would provide somebody to help people go out and procure and test journey planners to see which ones were worth pursuing or not in the Wild West days where you know, there were myriad different journey planners available. Um, and um, there, there's a bit of a consensus starting that we need to do perhaps do something similar to come up with um, a set of benchmarks to help identify um, what produces good journey plans and what doesn't. Um, one of the missing things um, though in this from all the conversations is actually what does um, a normal traveller, an uneducated public transport user um, need and want, what are their expectations and requirements. So that sort of user piece, a lot of the conversations are with people that, you know, like yourselves that will regularly use public transport technology, 
know how to handle the foibles and look at something and go that just doesn't seem right i'm gonna try and plan it again with a you know a bit of a tweaked um set of criteria and things like that um so you know what's that real world customer need um and so there's a proposal um by atco um that they convene a group and involve transport focus um to put together a workshop day conference type thing on journey planners and look at what users might need and um some benchmark type questions and challenges for planners when people are assessing them um and so and goes out to PTIC. do we want to be involved in that um should we be um and uh, if the consensus is yes then we will uh, get involved and pull something together with atco and transport focus i don't know whether anybody's got any thoughts and comments on that or whether there's a load of thumbs up dan yeah so it's an interesting subject um we've just done some work about putting a new algorithm into our uh, track software and as part of that we benchmarked uh, journeys against various you know google maps against uh, the travel line journey planner against other kind of uh, api tickle and it's amazing the variation in results that you would get as part of it and i think there's 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 a few different ways that we worked out that that, that very one would be that you know the way and when it last updated the raw data is one of the things which people can't control the algorithm itself that was used and the assumptions that are done algorithms are very readily deterministic they require iterations and online journey planners need to be really really quick so they make assumptions and uh, especially on longer journeys and things like that that aren't always correct um so i think the goal to try and have some sort of way of working out what is a good journey plan and getting involved in it is a is an idea of merit um i think the issue would be is how do you change commercial people like google and people like to change the way in which they which they do these journey plans actually google came across really bad and our testing uh is not giving the right result a lot of the time travel line came out as one of the better ones um but it's that sort of thing but then how do you get that news across to the end consumer and how do you force change as part of it unless you get some sort of buy-in from I don't know who you get buy-in from to get people to to change it um but yeah I think there's a role for PTIC to have within that because on the data side of things we're we're, we're, we're experts um as part of it I'd say it's my two cents worth anyway yeah okay Nick I think you know a lot of it does come back to the data that's going in at the start if the data that the operators are producing ultimately is poor quality the outputs from any journey planner are going to be poor quality. Yeah. And I think, you know, given that where operators are now having to produce their schedule data in quite a few different formats to fit different things that require the data, the the room for data slip just has increased, I think. You know, we in Cornwall, operators are producing BODS data, they're producing trans exchange for their own websites. They're producing trans exchange for real time systems. Um, and there's the, the I've been doing some work this week on pulling mileage data for services. And what I'm seeing is that the, the room for data to slip between different systems has expanded in this space we're in now. So the operator's own websites are generally OK, but the minor amendment that they've made may not have found its way into travel line which in turn's not found it into josh's website if he's to pulling travel line data or bods data and you know just so many different streams of data out there it's become almost become a full-time industry for someone within a bus operator to manage all this now an interesting yeah. point now is, is is on london so for example uh some people assume no interchange times on journey planners between getting from the platform uh, from 
ground level to an underground station. So I've seen in some of the stuff we're doing, effectively, it was impossible to do that journey uh, because you wouldn't be able to get from getting off a bus to get onto a tube station. It might take you five minutes to do to walk that journey to get to the to the platform edge. And that sort of thing, like some, especially APIs that we, we utilised, assumed an almost instantaneous interchange. That sort of thing, as well as the data, there's inferred data that people need to put into it and what should that inferred data be? And that's maybe where something like BTIC or something like can come and say, actually, if you're interested between these two modes, you need to allow for X, Y, Z to, to have that transit time on by foot to go between modes and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's another an interesting element, I think. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, anybody else got any thoughts? Again, John's sort of with us. I was the only thing I was going to echo is again, I don't, I never use Google to plan a journey. And the number of complaints that we get about people who have got wrong information from Google, and with our standard response to those complaints is, well, don't use Google. Yeah, I, I was, I was waiting for Peter. You were, you were slower off the mark than I thought you might have been, Peter. <laughs> Well, I, I just I just think in this sort of discussion, we ought to be careful about just making these generalizations. Um, there's the whole point is to bring in the very many dimensions of what the uh, a good journey planner could be. And um, and of course, it's reach, uh, say, you know, Google's strengths might be its reach. Uh, uh, and uh, across uh, so the, the great wet breadth of the Google search and the integration, the penetration of public transport it gets. Um, I mean, the you you also have to bear in mind that it's um, it's one of the big differences. It, it it uses its own gazetteer, and um, that I think is you've got to be very careful in testing as to whether you're coming with. Um, some assumptions from the industry as to uh, uh, as to how you will ask your questions and pose your your results. I'm not particularly want to defend it. I'm a, we, we 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 are very well aware and supplying the data to Google of of, of some of the issues, but um, we need to have a sensible discussion about it. And I don't think we should be uh, um, going around knocking the various ones in without really presenting for from this meeting presenting quite a detailed level of scrutiny um, or else we just sort of join the popular press and bandwagon of um, sort of innuendo and all the rest i think we should avoid that yeah no absolutely i i agree peter and and perhaps your uh, and others involvement who understand the way data is best provided to some of these suppliers to make sure that they understand it properly and can make the best use of it will be an important outcome um absolutely we're very happy to be involved in those discussions yeah yeah mike um i was just going to say i think it's um I, I forgot who mentioned it someone mentioned just just a little while ago is it the is is the issue of where the data is coming from for for whichever journey planning you might be using and i think there is a problem of certainly I come across operators in Leicester that, you know, particularly small, smaller operators or not not the main major operators, and they complain about the fact that they have to supply, supply data to BODS, to the real time system, to maybe the ticket ticketer for the ticket machine. So that, that there's there's a whole host of of things that operators have to do uh, that is quite resource hungry and they haven't got much resource. So yeah where where the, where does the where does the whichever journey planner we use or is being used where does it get its data from i mean i guess this is this comes back to is bods going to be the holy grail or the the bible or the the the, the main repository for this which i guess it is, is the intention but it, it's it, i guess that's an obvious thing to say but but it, it but it is a fact of life um mm. Yeah, and understanding those data flows will be important and uh, and where those lags are potentially. Um, I know that Travel Line in the past have done um, work on that, for example, which proved to be quite useful in, in working out some of the problems with plans that were being presented and things like that. 
Um, so, uh, yeah. OK, so. Um, do I take it from those comments and that conversation then that that's something that as PTIC we want to be involved in? And so I'll carry on conversations with ATCO um, and we will um, have a session um, to look at that along with them and Transport Focus. Um, Keith. So I missed it, but it was all about journey can planners. But I was just speaking to someone else while I left, but that they, they were using the stop validity within NAPTAN basically, and they started to use it a lot more, but they were having trouble to find journey planners that picks up the stop validity within NAPTAN about transfers and suspended uh, stops. So just as you were talking about journey plan reliability and all that, it was how that really fits in. And then using that when they you know do their trans exchange or update or export and all that kind of stuff, whether that fits into that or not. I'm sure it does in the same way that you get a cancelled journey, you can get a cancelled bus stop or a bus stop that's not available for a period of time. So yeah, that's a, we need to, uh, to remember that stops move in and out of use, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, if we, um move on to um while we're talking about journey planners um we'll pick up travel line um so um normally we'd have uh, an update from travel line they've got a board meeting next week looking at their future work and things like that and so julie is going to provide us with an update um, after that, which I'll circulate round, I'll make sure that we get that. Mike or Amy, I don't know whether there's anything you want to say, seeing as you're actually on the call. I think, like Julie said in her update, Tim, that this, the, the conversation happening next week, so we'll be able to give a more meaningful update for the minutes next week once we've had those conversations. OK, thank you. Um, Heath again. Was that a new hand? No, sorry. OK, right. Yeah. OK. Um, in at the last meeting we had in December, um, for those of you who were on it, um, you will remember the um, presentation and lengthy discussion we had with Ordnance Survey, who were presenting us with their, la their latest iteration of mapping services, uh, a National Geographic database, which looked um, like a really interesting development. Um, we had another session dedicated to uh, National Geographic database with them in January, um, which was well attended and a number of you were on that. Um, hopefully you understand more about what they're offering um, from that. Um, there's a number of actions that they're taking as a result of that to look at how to better present data and model it and represent it. Um, I know that Sarah Aladley was uh, talking to them um, about that. Um, and how they can use NAPTAM within the products to help and the references in particular to help um, with matching of data, for example, tracks and things like that um, for people creating that. One of the actions that came out of it, though, um, was to do with Ordnance Survey licensing um, and how non-public sector bodies might be able to get at it because uh, the mapping products that were they were talking about are available in the um, pan government agreement um, if that's the right phrasing but anyway it's available to central and local government um, as part of the deal um, and it's available to um, people who are providing services under contract to 
the public sector, so a journey planner supplier, for example, or a website provider. Um, what's slightly less clear at the moment is how that might be available to providers who don't have a direct contract with an authority, you know, providing a commercially available website or app or something like that. Um, yes, thank you. I knew I knew it was wrong um, when I said what the agreement name was. I just couldn't remember what it was. Thank you. Um, but um, and the like, so app providers and things like that and operators who often struggle to get high quality mapping available. Um, and a lot of that comes down to the licensing terms of it. Um, and so um, I've carried on talking to them about those um, licensing issues and implications, and we're hoping that in April we'll be able to have some sessions with um, operators and app providers um, and commercial type system providers. Um, to understand some more about the 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 way that they operate and the split between commercial and public sector um, operation and things like that to work through the licensing to try and make ordnance survey data more available to the public transport industry in general um, for um, sort of presentation also, you know, it's the mapping raster layer that you see, but also um, routing algorithms to use uh, OS uh, road routes and things like that, rather than um, open street map and things like that to provide a an, another set of options. Um, so we're hoping that that's going to be able in April. There's quite a lot of conversations going on at Ordnance Survey between lawyers and things like that at the moment. Um, I don't know whether anybody wants to add anything that was on that mapping session or um, questions and thoughts about Ordnance Survey mapping. No. OK. Um, we then uh, move on to... Uh, EU standards development. So um, after a couple of years of quite a lot of work um, and updates to um, standards such as Siri um, and NetEx, um, things are now um, a bit quieter. There's a number of the bits of work that have been going on for the last couple of years just waiting for formal votes and things like that. Um, anything to do with international standards just takes a long time sometimes. Um, so we're in a quiet phase um, at the moment. There's some work going on with Transmodel, which is the overall architecture that NetEx and Siri and things like that fit under just to make sure that that actually reflects what's going on in the uh, in the lower tiers of standards. Um, and um, there's some updates to um, NetEx, um, which is all about the planning side of things, um, what's planned. So um, looking at things like uh, seating plans on vehicle so you can um, move booking data around between systems more easily, um, deck plans for ferries and trains that have got more than one um, level on them, not particularly relevant in the UK because I don't think we've got any double deck trains, um, but there's work going on there um, and um, there's some work going to start next year um, on NetEx to improve the way that it handles driver duties. 
um, and the scheduling of driver duties, um, which might be quite interesting uh, to this group. Um, but otherwise, we're in a bit of a quiet phase uh, on European standards. Um, has anybody got any questions or comments on EU standards? Well, I should not EU, I should say European because they're not tied to the EU and the EU is a bit of a problem sometimes in terminology. Um, I've got a question that John Carr raised um, in his note. Um, it's directed at the DFT. Um, so I suggest that we uh, I send an email to them about it um, because it's it's not Naptan, so it's unfair for Haraj and Hannah to uh, to take it. But it's about DFT taking ownership of standards development and interoperability with major markets, Asia and America now. Historically, the focus has been on interworking with Europe and things like that, but with a broader view of the world post Brexit, what role and ownership are DFD going to take on um, working with standards uh, internationally? Teresa? Yeah, I was actually going to ask a question which may be related to that. Um, I've been, I used to be a CDM coordinator. Um, and I've seen online, I haven't investigated it from a transport side, it might be what John's talking about, but um, there's this talk of this huge bonfire of all the UK um, enactments of, of EU legislation and stuff by the end of this year, and it looks like, I mean, they're, they're completely up in arms from a health and safety side, um, and it looks like it's just going ahead. That might be what John's talking about, what if anything, and I, and I haven't got around to understanding what the implications are from a transport side yet, but it looks like no one's got any time, they don't care, they're just going to sweep it under the carpet and by January 2024 we're left in a complete pigsty <laughs> um, of various things. I don't know if that's what John was saying, but... Um... No, I don't either, but th no. there is quite a lot of work going on um, between um, the DFT and the likes of CPT to understand what the world might look like um, after the end of the year once the bonfire regulations <laughs> takes place okay. um, because that involves drivers due working hours and all sorts of things. Um, I mean it's not just transport it's across the board um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah so um, that was going to be it sounds like well, I don't know, it might just happen for that. It sounds like a few people at least are thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, in increasingly, I think. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. OK. Um, then um, I'm aware that often the agenda is driven by, of, of PTIC is driven by, um, what the DFT need us to be being aware of um, and changes um, that need to be made to support those sort of the activities like BODs and things like that. Um, but that does leave a bit of a gap that we tend to be a bit reactive. We did some work last year on 15 minute neighbourhoods, which has been quite useful for a number of people. Um, but I'm aware that perhaps we should be doing some different things, having our eye on on in in areas that we're not focusing on or or aware of and talking about. So um, every now and then the question gets asked, um, you know, what should PTIC be doing that we're not doing and you know, if we're doing something that's of no value to people, then we'll we'll stop it quite happily, I'm sure. Um, so um, it's an open question, really, um, about what do people want us to be doing that we're not perhaps not doing.
I don't know whether anybody's got any thoughts. No. Dan. Uh, I guess I'll say what, what I find is useful about PTIC, because maybe that's something that could be kind of expanded on maybe further. Mm. So what I what I find really useful is getting all the updates on the on the major projects uh, from people like the DFT and boards and NAPTAN and the travel line project updates and that kind of stuff. I think that's a really, really good thing. I just want to work out if that remit could be expanded further, because obviously it's meant to be all motor transport. I know that ATCO, was that ATCO or uh, 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 RDG Road Delivery Group did a couple of updates for a while and they kind of dropped off for a bit. But I found that update that was quite interesting about the open data marketplace and what they were going to do and things. I was trying to work out if there's anything else in that kind of remit or people doing things with transport or transport data that could be giving updates to this kind of group to find out what's kind of what's kind of going on. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah. Any anybody else wants to no. well, if you do think of anything, um then please do feel free to um Drop me or Teresa a line and we will um, put something together. Um, uh, so next, uh, the issues log, um, there is nothing um, new on the issues log. Um, the uh, only thing on the issues log at the moment is the bank holiday. Um, handling in the BODS data profile, which is uh, ongoing. And then um, next meeting, we've been extremely organised for those of you that have um, been looking at the website and we have dates for the rest of the year on the website and you can um, do your Eventbrite stuff now all the way through to uh, December. But the next meeting is the 8th of June um we will do it online unless people really want to um meet somewhere face to face um in which case the first question will be can you host it um but uh online often is easier for people to make um so yeah 8th of june and that then gets us to any other business which for some reasons dropped off the end of my agenda Rob, um, I was asked this earlier on by a bus operator um, and I didn't know the answer, so I thought I'd ask here. Um, is there a standard name for the forthcoming Coronation Bank holiday? And should we all be using a particular terminology for it when we put it into trans exchange files for BODS? Uh, a very good uh, um, question. Um, there isn't at the moment. Um, various names are being used um, and uh, on my list of to do tomorrow is to put together a uh, note on the coronation holiday and the dates um, like we did for the funeral and the um, jubilee last year and so um, if people have any particular views on what it should be um, in the um, advice note, then please put them in the chat or send me an email before about 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, otherwise, I will um, <laughs> have a look at some people's data and work out what the most common one is. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, Nick. So just um, on the discussions about bank holidays, does that pick up the issue around 
um, Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve early runoffs. So which, the way that that's coded was part of those conversations, and it is the um, perhaps the most challenging thing for operators to handle at the moment. So yeah, it's absolutely in scope of that thinking. My thought is on it is, is surely it can be as simple as those journeys which are not operating on the 24th and 31st are simply coded of a day of exception, isn't it? Rather than needing to create a whole separate set of data for those two days. Yeah, that's that's one of the ways that has been suggested of doing it, yes. Because if I'm brutally honest, that's how I've been handling it in real time data for the last four or five years. I've just been going in and manually adjusting the file before I upload it to our RTPI system. Yeah, yeah, that's what that's one of the ways that um, people were suggesting uh, of improving things. So yeah, yeah, that's all for me. Okay, if there is nothing else from anybody thank you amy for the um comment and peter about name um if there is nothing else from anybody then uh, thank you for your time this afternoon um and um see you uh in um june if not before, um, and just looking at the PTIC diary, I should put a, uh, a just say that over the next few weeks, there are a number of analysed bus open data sessions with ITO. Um, the next one focused on uh, operators and operator data quality issues is next week, and then we've got one on vehicle journeys and then one on using ABODs for supporting BSIPs. So uh, if those are of interest, you can sign up for those through the PTIC website. Mike. Sorry, I just wanted to ask, you know, like the, the operator one, Can am I allowed to go to that even though I'm not an operator or just, just as a matter of interest? To yes, oh, abs absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You're more than welcome. It's just we there was one this week focused on on authorities yeah. um because authorities and operators have slightly different issues okay and thank sets you that's the questions mm. thanks rob um yeah just picking up on uh on that um abods discussion um i remember some time ago possibly a year ago when we had the earlier presentations there was very much a restriction on um agents such as myself being permitted to use ABODs, it was very much targeted at the operators directly. Um, has that changed? I got the impression from the um, the invitation that that agents were now being considered um, for using ABODs. Is is that a correct assumption? So it's it's it says operators and agents because it's about data quality, and sometimes operators use agents in terms of access to ABOD for an agent. I don't know, Patrick, you're perhaps. Yeah, yeah. So, so it is on a kind of situational basis. So, whether the operators that you're responsible for are happy for you to have access uh, to that data, then um, they can forward an invitation to their organisation. So, they will be able to invite you. Um, but if obviously there's um, a group of operators whereby, a, like a unique organisation, needs to be set up by ourselves, um, we can obviously discuss it and you'd have to get um, an agreement with with the operators that you want to get access to. That's brilliant. Thanks very much, Patrick. Thanks. No worries. OK, if there's nothing else, I'm going to say uh, thank you all for your time this afternoon and see you in June. Thank you.